Welcome to today's episode of the Back in Shape podcast. Today we're going to be talking all about spinal decompression to help you guys better understand this concept. It is something that is used rather casually, both medically, uh, with specialists, with practitioners such as osteopaths, chiropractors, as well as in online programs and various exercises that you'll see online. It really can, because of this, lead to quite a lot of confusion around the concept. So today we're going to talk about surgical examples, we're going to talk about clinical examples, we're going to also talk about exercises, and just so you get a better understanding of how to analyze a specific modality of spinal decompression so you can appreciate the consequences of maybe using one over the other and also appreciate that fundamentally spinal decompression is a tool a tool that can be used and incorporated in the exercises that you're doing in the rehabilitation that you're doing to help oppose the stresses of day-to-day -day life so let's start off with a definition of what spinal decompression actually is and fundamentally it is going to be to take pressure off the spine or to take pressure off something. So when we think of decompression, we think of the load. The spine is a load-bearing structure and the primary load-bearing structure within the spine specifically is going to be the discs. Those are the areas that, that bear most of the load on a daily basis. So when we think of decompression, we think of taking pressure off these discs first and foremost. The secondary thing to consider when we're talking about spinal decompression, as we'll see with some of the examples later on, is going to be a kind of secondary form of spinal decompression in so much as if we have axial compression, so compression through the spine from load, from gravity, from strain. And then we can result in disc, uh, disc bulges, like the little red mark you see here. And that is creating a compression with inflammation in the exit foramina, where these little nerves come out of. And you might quite often hear that we're going to perhaps decompress that area where the nerve is being trapped. And we'll start to see this as we explore and compare some of the different examples of spinal decompression, that sometimes we're focusing more on that secondary aspect, when in actual fact that can have consequences and make things maybe a little bit worse, when really we should be trying to focus on spinal decompression methods that focus more on the axial load through the discs. So let's start off with the surgical form of decompression. And really here, there are going to be two. And, and both of these actually address both of those that I've just mentioned. The first one, addressing the decompression of these little spaces here where the nerves come out of. So for example, you've had an MRI report. It says that you've got L the L5-S1 disc is contacting the uh, L5 nerve root or the S1 nerve root and putting pressure on that nerve pressure so we want to decompress and in that case it might be that there is some um, scraping off or, or removal of that piece of disc material it might be that there are some bony spurs in that area and it might be some uh, removal of those bony spurs to create more space in that area to decompress the area that's option number one addressing that secondary part the other option is that we might be having an artificial disc put in that artificial disc will decompress these two vertebrae by moving them further apart and again having the same effect on that back space that opening out of the exit foramen but also decompressing the disc itself in a more permanent manner now both of those surgical examples are fundamentally quite permanent in their short-term effects however if we don't address the underlying causes then we can start to get continuing of symptoms and the need for further in interventions later on and that's really where a failure of rehabilitation comes in we haven't done the necessary rehabilitation to address the causes for the need for that particular surgical intervention but those are the two most common forms and you'll have different permutations of those, but forms of surgical spinal decompression. And a lot of the stuff you're gonna see online is not going to be referring to that. And they're very, very simple, very clear cut, and you can see exactly where that removal of the compressive or pressure, uh, compressive forces or pressure in and around the spine takes place. Then we move on to the more therapeutic methods. Now these could be a form of mechanized traction, and that is going to be affecting primarily this particular the first the first variation where we are going to be taking pressure off the disc directly so an axial pull pulling along the length of the spine to unload the disc now the benefits of this sort of thing are that you're going to get exchange of nutrients exchange of fluids you're taking local pressure off those discs as well through mechanisms like idd therapy or mechanized spinal decompression these are taken into consideration in most cases and with explicit experience in using idd therapy personally you have a nice little bladder that inflates when the person is strapped in to support the natural lordosis of the spine. So it respects the natural structure of the spine whilst pulling and taking pressure off or decompressing the relevant discs. So those are, are, are versions where we can achieve that decompression without the need for surgical interventions. But as we move from the surgical to the non-surgical, we start to realize the glaringly obvious question that many people often get asked or often ask practitioners is, well, as soon as I stop doing it, doesn't the compression come back on? And to that, the reply is, yes, of course it does. However, 
we are working to get that pumping of fluid into these disc spaces, alleviate temporarily that pressure on the disc so that it almost gets a chance to breathe again and get a little bit more exchange of the good the, the, the good products that it needs for healing, oxygenation of blood, etc., as well as a removal of the waste metabolites, maybe debris from damaged tissue in the disc, etc. Then we move on to more manual variations of spinal decompression. And these could be handheld traction. So much like that previous example where we're using a machine to do the work, which is going to be very precise, very repeatable, very measurable. We've got a manual version where we would maybe hold onto the spine and pull or create a traction manually. Now, yes, this is great because we can achieve that decompression in the local segment. But again, it's a temporary uh, fix is a temporary decompression of that particular segment, but it is invariably going to be respecting the neutral alignment of the lumbar spine. It's going to be taking pressure off that first need of decompression rather than the secondary that I mentioned. So taking pressure off the discs rather than just making the holes larger. And by doing one, you tend to do the other simultaneously, just in a safer and more effective manner. But the downfall with this sort of approach is going to be that it's not really measured. It's not, you're not able to do it in a sustained manner. And sometimes it can be quite unreliable in that regard. And if you've seen some of the videos online of these done as adjustments, so short, sharp thr traction thrusts, you'll see that they can be um, quite powerful to say the least and quite eye-opening uh, in many cases. Then we get on to other forms of decompression. This might be lying on your front on a bench like the one behind me. And that could be lying like so, and there, in these cases, we might be decompressing like so. So you can see we're actually moving into flexion here. We're focusing more on opening out these little spaces on the back here and a little bit of traction as well. But we are now starting to forget or prioritize in a lesser manner the natural alignment of that spine by incorporating a degree of flexion to do this decompression. We are focusing more on the entrapment at the back of the spine where maybe there's inflammation or disc material compressing some of the nerves to take that pressure off. And sometimes the consequences of that, as we've mentioned in other episodes of the podcast, can be detrimental. Then we get on to the more exercise-based, stretching-based forms of spinal decompression. Now this could be, again, decompressing that little exit foramen down here with a knee hug, hugging our knees towards our chest and opening out that space there and creating that decompression effect to alleviate pressure in the exit foramen. Or alternatively, it could be simply hanging from a bar in the gym to create that axial stretch. But the problems with these again are quite often the patient or the individual might do them with too much force. Completely hanging from the bar in the gym, for example, will not only be a very rapid onset of force, but also as you drop yourself back down again, all of a sudden that force comes back on. So some of those mechanisms can have inherent disadvantages in, and also they're not necessarily something that we can do in a repeated manner safely because of those disadvantages as well. And when we think of things like the knee hugs or the child's poses, those have huge disadvantages because they are opening out the structures on the back part of the spine. We've discussed in previous podcasts at length, the disadvantages of more rounding of that lumbar spine, more opening out of these spaces where the where the back parts of the vertebra should be nice and tight to support the natural lordosis. By eliminating that further, as so many of the daily activities we do in modern life do already, we don't need any more of that. So that brings me to three points of evaluation that you really want to consider when you're looking at a modality of spinal decompression, because some of them will contradict. So if we take the example of that knee hug, which is decompressing a part of the spine taking pressure off a certain area. And then we consider something like our personal favorite, the towel, which I'll get into a little bit later. Both of those have a cost when we do them. Now, first of all, what are we actually going to be decompressing? In the case of the knee hug, we're gonna be decompressing that posterior space, that exit foramen, opening out the space a little bit there. In the case of the towel, we're going to be putting a axial stretch, a stretch through this section of the spine. How exactly are we going to be doing it? Well, we're going to be hugging onto our knees or we're going to be utilizing a towel to put pressure up through the spine to create that stretch along the length of the spine. And finally, the all important secondary consequences. What are the consequences of doing this? Well, if we look at the towel, there's not really many secondary consequences. Yes, we want to be careful getting on and off the towel as we've discussed many, many times before. But if we think about the secondary consequences of, say, a surgical intervention, we've got scar tissue there. 
If we think of the secondary consequences of a knee hug, we might be disrupting some of the healing that's taking place in this back section here as we pull to open these tissues that are trying to heal and knit back up to form that lordosis. So thinking of the secondary consequences of this mechanism that we're using for spinal decompression is vitally important to be able to establish which ones we can do. Because ultimately, a lot of those therapeutic, if not all of the therapeutic methods of spinal decompression are things that can be done and should be done on a regular basis. A way of offsetting the load of gravity on injured tissues, let's say it's your L5-S1 disc, it is having to bear load on a daily basis. You're having to sit at work, you're having to stand to move around the world. Having an opportunity on a regular basis to come up for air, so to speak, or to decompress the spine in a way that does not create trouble as a consequence in other areas whilst you're doing the decompression is vital and that allows you to do it more frequently during the day or during the week. Now granted, if you're choosing some of those treatment options such as IDD therapy or visiting a practitioner for adjustments of some description to do the spinal decompression in that manner, it's going to attract a little bit more cost. It's maybe not going to be done as regularly. But from our personal experience in clinic, we would use spinal decompression regularly. We would then have patients at home doing their towel exercise to get some form of decompression in the house on a daily basis, multiple times a day, to reinforce that decompressive effect whilst, and this is the all important part, doing something else. Whether you are having a surgical intervention and putting an artificial disc in, whether you're having a treatment from a chiropractor or an osteopath or a physiotherapist, whether you're doing the knee hugs at home, which hopefully you aren't after watching the video this far, or whether you're doing the towel exercise that we talk about quite a lot, whichever one of those you're doing, they are a tool to passively unload the spine, to create space for the structures that are perhaps dealing with too much load or too much successive load over a long period of time and it is a vital exercise that really really helps and could be considered to be a spine hygiene exercise you brush your teeth every single day multiple times a day because you use your teeth well taking the pressure off your spine because you use it every day is a wise thing to do to improve the overall health but it does not get your back stronger Getting your back stronger involves doing resistance-based exercises, some form of progressive strengthening program to rehabilitate the sections of your spine that are injured, that are maybe a bit more vulnerable, to create, create more support so you can more effectively deal with the loads of gravity on a daily basis and the stresses and strains that daily life put upon you without incorporating spinal decompression alongside rehabilitative exercises. Even if it's the case of a surgical intervention, if you do not rehabilitate properly afterwards, you leave all of those factors that were stressing your spine to the point at which it requires surgery still in play, still creating trouble. And so often in cases like that, you see you might've had L5S1 disc become fused or have the intervention at that level. And then all of a sudden you see over a couple of years, because we haven't addressed those underlying reasons, we find that all of a sudden the L4-5 or the L3-4 disc all of a sudden becomes problematic as well because we haven't really done the rehabilitation. Ultimately, it takes a lot of work, a lot of hard work and spinal decompression. Many of these are quite simple, quite easy exercises to do. The towel, for example, you can simply lie over it in this lower back position. It's quite, quite focused at the L4-5 and L5-S1 level, creating a gentle stretch and holding your spine in a nice neutral position, opposing some of that flexion that goes through on a daily basis when we're sitting for long periods of time. And you can do that multiple times a day, but it is the strengthening that you do alongside that that allows the decompression to be more and more helpful. The relief that you get from that decompression to be reinforced and supported afterwards by stronger and stronger musculature and by better and better movement patterns. So. As always, when we're doing these podcasts, you guys have the comment section. If you're watching on YouTube, or watching on the website, you can comment down in the section below. If you've got any questions, maybe you've been told about spinal decompression, maybe you've been told to do this decompression exercise or that decompression procedure, and you're not quite sure about it. Let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are and what challenges you've had with this procedure. Many of you, for example, with the towel as a decompression mechanism, will find that it's difficult to start with. It's a bit uncomfortable because so much of what you've been doing has been rounding over the spine for so many years and actually taking pressure off for the first time can be a little bit uncomfortable at first. But as long as you understand, you evaluate what you're doing, how it's being done, and the secondary consequences of that decompression, you can start to incorporate it in a way akin to brushing your teeth every day that keeps your body healthy for the long term. As always, thanks so much for watching us. If you did find this episode particularly helpful, consider it sharing, sharing it with someone else who could benefit. And remember, you can always subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest podcasts every single week. See you next time.